all right. It's 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 all right. Don't you know that a just a little talk with Jesus makes it right? Do you believe it's all right? It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Don't you know that a just a little talk with Jesus makes it right? I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me. From heaven fill my soul It made my heart in love And wrote my name above And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole And I said it's all right, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. Don't you know that it's just a little talk with Jesus makes it right? Do you believe it's all right? It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Don't you know that it's just a little talk with Jesus makes it right? I may have doubts and fears. My eyes be filled with tears. But Jesus is a friend. Watches day and night. I go to him in prayer. He knows my every care. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. And I said it's all right. 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 Don't you know? Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Do you believe it's all right? It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Don't you know that a just a little talk with Jesus makes it right? Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. He will answer by and by. You feel a little prayerful yearning. As your heart into heaven is turning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I said it's all right, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. Don't you know that a just a little talk with Jesus makes it right? Do you believe it's all right? It's all right, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. Don't you know that a just a little talk with Jesus makes it right? Hey, good morning. Welcome to the Twickenham Church of Holiness <laughs> in all things that are smooth. So. It's all right. It really is. It's, it's all right. Hey, if you're a guest, thanks for coming out to be with us today. Um, we hope you have a good time. We really do. Until we get to the sermon. Sermon's not going to be so fun today. Can I just tell you that right up front? It will be all right, but it'll be a little in your face today, which is a good thing. We need that. If you're a guest, we're glad you're here. If you're looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members. Talk with us after the service, and we'd love to talk with you about how we receive new folks. Learn about your story. You can hear about what God's doing in ours. So we just love to have that conversation. There is a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out, and you can put that in the collection plate. If you'd like a call from somebody, indicate that on the card. If you'd like to have us pray about something, put that on the card. We'll be praying about those as early as this afternoon. Just really glad you've come to be with us. Hey, let me get you to stand. Let me share a passage with you here as we get started here from 1 Peter chapter 2. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, holy nation, God's special possession. Why? That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Let's do that. Let's declare the praises of him who called us. 
Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of his brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Slain, worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is a failing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all the eternity long and find there is none like you there is none like you no one else can touch my heart like you do I could search for all of eternity search for all eternity long and find there is none there is none there is none like you would you take just a moment and meditate on our scripture this morning from Micah 7 Who is a God like you, who pardons sin 
and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Would you meditate on that again for another moment? Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is Graven. tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin because the sinless Savior died my sinful soul morning. Uh, the last time I was up here, I was uh, about to get married to my beautiful wife, and I was a little nervous then, but um, I don't think there was quite as many people here for that. Uh, however, I take heart in the fact that we are not surrounded by strangers. Rather, we are among brothers and sisters in Christ, and we can come to this table and share in this meal as one body with Christ as our head. Um, I'll be reading from Isaiah 53 to prepare our hearts and minds. Who has believed our message and to whom the, has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
Let's pray for the bread. Lord, you came down in the flesh to walk among us. You were despised and rejected. You were mocked and ridiculed. And you were handed over by your own people to be crucified on the cross. Lord, it was on that cross that your body was broken. And as we break this bread that represents your body, I pray that we do it in remembrance of you, Lord. Amen. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, 
And as a sheep before his shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And and though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Let's pray for the cup. Jesus, we humbly come before you once again, and we know you're at your Father's right hand. And right now, there are 100 million angels surrounding the throne in heaven, and they are all saying, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Jesus, we acknowledge that you are that perfect lamb. You who knew no sin became sin. And it was your atoning blood that was shed on the cross that has reconciled us to you. Lord, as we take this cup, I pray that we would take it in a manner that's pleasing to, pleasing to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Joshua. And we'll be in chapter 7 this morning if you want to go ahead and turn over there. Uh, easiest way to get there is to go to Genesis and start turning right or left. About six books and you'll find Joshua. It's a, it's a really great series of stories in the book of Joshua. And it's a really great book for us to be living in right now because in many ways we are where they were. Uh, they were facing what they believed was going to be an awesome future, but they'd never been that way before. So forging ahead into that future was going to require a very muscular faith. God was going to be there with them and for them every step of the way, but he was going to challenge them to do some things and to go some and take some steps that were going to be really uncomfortable. And one of the themes that I think keeps coming up in the, the book of Joshua is that God is not always very interested in your comfort. He's interested in your character, but your comfort is way down his list of priorities. So the faith they needed for that period in their history is the faith we need in this period for ours. Because we're, we're entering into a season of reflection and discernment and discovery of where God wants to take us in the coming years. A couple of weeks ago, our, our shepherds and uh, our ministers took a weekend away and met with a brother named John Mulliken, uh, who John helps churches develop uh, and walk through a process of listening for God's direction and guidance. And, this afternoon, we'll actually be meeting again to pray and think more about that process that we're entering. So, you ever had anybody ask you, this is a really great question, um, what kind of old person do you want to be? That's a penetrating question. It makes you think about your future. Or we're asking kind of the same question. We're asking in 20 years, what kind of church does God want us to be? Not, not what kind of church do we want to be, what kind of church does God want us to be? And then this question, follow, following that one is, what do we need to do between now and then to be that kind of church? So th these are crucial questions because churches, and this includes us, are a lot like the human beings that make them up. We are fond of the familiar. We like it. And we are afraid of the next. In other words, we're a lot like Israel was on the border of their future, which is why we need a faith for where we've never been. So let me give you a quick two-minute recap of 
where what we've seen so far in the book of Joshua, as it opens, Israel has been, been doing the same thing over and over for 40 years. They are trapped in a wilderness of inertia, proving that it is exceptionally difficult to generate the escape velocity required to climb out of the gravity well of the familiar. If you've ever tried to change a habit, if you've ever tried to start and stay on a diet, if you ever said, I'm going to read through the Bible this year if it kills me, then you understand where Israel was. They were stuck and couldn't get out. Fortunately, God was um, enough of a force to move them out of that, that God's this external force that came in, helped them overcome that inertia, and that makes sense because God makes all things new, and that includes nations and churches and people and you and me. And then in the next major episode, the, it features the only person in the Canaanite city of Jericho, Jericho who had faith in God, and she was not president of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, her name was Rahab, and she was a prostitute. Her story reminds us that God has always used the most unlikely people to move his mission forward and that we need those unlikely people in our church even as much as they need us in their lives. Joshua chapters 3 and 4, Israel stands on the, the Jordan River, the last barrier between them and the promised land. God goes first, leads them through the waters, and they learn that sometimes faith means that you have to stand in the middle of the struggle and chaos for a minute or two before God delivers. The time between the promise and the deliverance is when our faith is stretched and tested. It is uncomfortable, but it is necessary because that's when we learn what real trust is. You may be in one of those moments in your life right now, standing in the middle of the chaos, waiting for God's deliverance. Trust. So last week we looked at Joshua chapters 5 and 6. And the story of how God used this really strange strategy to give Israel a victory over the well-fortified city of Jericho. And I'm really grateful that you are okay with uncomfortable questions because we dealt with a couple of those last week. And that's a good thing because we're going to deal with a couple of them this morning too. Do you remember that time when your team won the big game? The, the big one, I mean the really big one. Your team won and everybody rushed out onto the field and the band played and, and confetti fell from the sky and you felt the press of all these people around you and it was okay because everything felt right with the world and the goal posts came down or the coach got up and, and cut the net off the, the goal. It was, it was just a wonderful moment. Do you remember that moment? Maybe the, right now the, the corners of your mouth are turning up a little bit because you remember what it was like when your team won. Well, that, that's how Israel felt when the dust settled at Jericho. It was their first battle. It was an odd way to win, but they'd won. The next opponent on their schedule was the little junior college town of Ai. It's spelled A-I. It was to Jericho what the Atlantic Coast Conference is to the SEC. And on the advice of his assistant coaches, Joshua didn't bother even dressing out the starters. He just sent in the second string, 3,000 soldiers. 30 of them didn't come back home alive. Not a high percentage, unless you're one of the families, one of the wives, children, parents, one of those 30 that didn't come home. Israel was routed. Joshua chapter 7 verse 5 says, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Joshua spent the rest of the day face down in the dirt in front of the Ark of the Covenant asking God why, which is what we do when something bad happens, right? Well, God answered it. And here was the answer. When God told Israel to destroy Jericho, he had specified that everything in the town all of the plunder was to be devoted to him. It was not to be taken by the people as their own. Well, somebody in the invading force, somebody on Israel's side, had disobeyed that command and had smuggled some of the plunder away for himself. Now Joshua knew the why. The question was, who? And so God is going to give Joshua a way to find that answer. I want to pick this story up in Joshua chapter 7, 
verse 14. God told Joshua, in the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. I want you to try to live in this for just a second, kind of imagine what this would have been like. You, your, your team just lost. You know why they lost, but you don't know whose fault it is. And it's important that you find that out. And so here's how God's going to help you do that. Present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe the Lord chooses shall come forward clan by clan. The clan the Lord chooses shall come forward family by family. And the family the Lord chooses shall come forward man by man. Whoever's caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire. Along with all that belongs to him, he has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Early the next morning, verse 16, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes. Now, there were 12 tribes. So we, we don't know exactly when the tribe, the guilty tribe, had to come forward. If this follows the same order that the census did back in Numbers 26, Reuben would have gone first. There are about 43,000 people in the tribe of Reuben. Simeon would have been next. That's 22,000 people. Gad, next. That's 40,000 people. Judah, 76,000. So you got a lot of people out here. So the next morning, Israel comes forward tribe by tribe, and Judah was chosen. The clans of Judah came forward. There were five clans in Judah. The Zerahites were chosen. He had the clan of the Zerahites come forward by families. I have no idea how many families were in Judah, but you got 76,000 people, so it's probably a lot of families. The families came forward, and the family of Zimri was chosen. Verse 18, Joshua had his family come forward man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. In other words, son, you better tell the truth. Tell me what you've done. Don't hide it. And Achan replied, it's true. I've sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I've done. When I saw the plunder, in, in the plunder, a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and I took them. They're hidden in the ground in my, inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent the messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in the tent with the silver underneath. Then they took the things from the tent, and they brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. All right, here's where the story gets icky. At God's command, Achan and all he possessed... And a lot of people, many people think, his family were stoned to death in a place called the Valley of Achor. That, the word Achor means trouble, which is probably a pretty good word to describe how we feel when we read a story like this, troubled by two questions. Why would, why would God command capital punishment for what seems to be so small a sin? The guy stole a nice Babylonian coat and a little silver and a little gold, and the person he stole them from was, was dead. Big deal. And then the second question, in what universe would it be fair for Achan's family to be punished for what he did? One of the benefits of reading through the Bible, cover to cover, is that you're forced to deal with questions and issues and passages you might otherwise avoid. That's why I hope that you'll keep up with your reading or catch up with it or pick up where we are, which I think is in the middle of 2 Kings right now. Just jump in. Look, it's a lot more fun to read about comfort and grace and forgiveness than it is to read about passages that confront, judge, and challenge, but we need both. If all we hear about is grace, we fail to take sin seriously. If all we hear about is judgment, we'll die of despair or just leave God altogether. As I told you last week, here at Twickenham, we try to lean into hard questions. So let's take a look at that second hard question first. Why would Achan's family be punished for what he did? The principle that, that lies beneath that question is pretty simple. Parents should not be punished for the sins of their children, and children should not be punished for the sins of their parents. That's just 
just. It's right. It makes sense. It seems fair. And you know what? The Bible totally agrees with that. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16 says, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for their own sin. If there's one thing the ancient Hebrews knew, it was the law of Moses. I can assure you that the author of Joshua knew Deuteronomy 24, 16. And yet the author does not seem troubled by any aspect of this story. What did he know that we don't? Well, a lot of the ancient rabbis believe that Achan's sons and daughters were not actually executed. And there is some ambiguity in the text. I know you've probably heard, as I've heard all my life, that Achan's children were killed along with him. Well, look at verses 24 and 25. Then Joshua, this is Joshua 7, then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys, and sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Achor. So we got everybody in the valley of Achor. Achan, the stuff he stole, his family, his possessions, they've moved everything he has to the valley of Achor. Look at verse 25. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him. And after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. The Talmudic rabbis taught that Achan's family was brought to the valley only to witness the execution, not to be executed themselves. The rabbis say that the phrase, they stoned the rest, refers to what happens to the things Achan stole and his possessions, not his family. That is a viable interpretation of this part of the passage. The traditional interpretation, the one that I grew up with, and you probably did too, is that even the family was executed. And if that's how it happened, how is that fair? The Bible doesn't offer any explanation, so we can only speculate. We know that at this time, Achan would have been an older man. You'll notice that his wife is never mentioned, so the thought is that he was a widower. His children would have been adults. Many of the interpreters that I've looked at conclude that, they, that, that the children, the adult children, were complicit in Achan's actions. None of us would be shocked, right, to discover that a dysfunctional family might hide a lot of secrets behind the facade of having it all together. They, they didn't, his, his children didn't take the forbidden items, but if they knew of Achan's theft, then they stood to benefit from it through inheritance. Though not guilty of his sin, they would have been condemned for their own. And I said this last week, it's worth repeating. If we are never offended or upset or challenged by something God says or does, then in all likelihood we're not dealing with the real God. We're talking about an idol that we built out of our own imaginations, one that doesn't offend us. We're talking about a God made in our image who conforms to our standards, who reflects our values. Now, do we really want a God who never makes us raise an eyebrow? Do we really want a God who never challenges our assumptions and our values and our standards? Do we really, don't, do we really want a God that never does anything to raise our blood pressure? The other question that we may have here is why would God command capital punishment for what seems to be so small a sin? To answer that question... Why don't we let the story ask a question of, our, uh, of its own, ask us a question. Why don't we take sin as seriously as God does? In verse 1, Joshua 7, 1, God called what Achan did an unfaithful act. He called it a violation in verse 11. And in verse 15, he said what Achan did was outrageous. Now, we use a lot of different words when we talk about sin. We call it a mistake or we talk about being messy, or we refer to sin as a struggle, or a slip-up, or a shortcoming, and sometimes we even wear sin as a badge of authenticity. Look how real I am. Confession becomes little more than what blogger Derek Rishmawi calls therapeutic self-narration. We tell our story, which is another popular euphemism these days, and we feel good about ourselves because we've been so real. 
But we never quite get around to the other R word, repentance. Passages like this one push us to be less comfortable with sin. They push back on our comfort level with struggle and shortcoming and fail, failing. Let me show you two things in this story that challenge us, that confront us. First, Achan demonstrates that internal sin always finds outward expression. Internal sin always finds outward expression. What, what is in you is going to come out of you. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Jesus said, Luke chapter 6, An evil person brings evil out of the evil that is stored up in the heart. In other words, if evil is coming out of you, then evil is what is in you. Go back and look at verse 21. I want you to notice how, how Achan describes his own downfall. He says, when I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe and the silver and the gold, I coveted and took and hid. Look at what he said. I saw, I coveted, I took, I hid. The first half of that confession is all about what's going on inside of Achan's heart, the seeing, the wanting, the coveting, the desire. The last half, I took, I hid, is the outward expression of his internal desire. This is exactly what James chapter 1 verses 14 to 15 teaches. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire is, has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. One of the most terrifying thoughts in all of Scripture, in all of reality, is that sin grows. It's terrifying. Those thoughts that we entertain, those desires that we toy with, those scenarios that we play out in our minds, thoughts, desires, and scenarios that we know run counter to God's will for our lives, they don't just stay in our heads, in our hearts. Eventually, they show up in our actions. What goes on inside of you is enormously important. I don't have to tell this crowd how important internal health is. 1986, Mission 51L, the right solid rocket booster, O-rings. The space shuttle Challenger didn't fall from the sky because it, it encountered an external force. It experienced an internal failure. That's what happened to Aiken. A thousand other people saw that fine Babylonian suit, that gold, that silver, and they didn't covet it. He did. He did not confess until he had been discovered, which is why disclosure is always better than discovery. What's going on, what was going on inside of him found its way out. Sin always finds its way out. In a sermon to pastors, and trust me, we need to hear this more than members do. Ed Stetzer told them, and I'm telling you, sin is not a pet to tame. It is a beast to to slay. Somebody in this room this morning is trying to tame a sin. You need to stop trying to tame it and slay it because it's going to kill you. What's inside you will come out. My friends in recovery are fond of saying, you're only as sick as your secrets. Somebody in this room this morning has a secret. It's going to come out. It will. Sin always does. You can disclose it through confession or it will be discovered by your actions. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay and it will cost you more than you want to pay. Internal sin always finds outward expression. That's lesson number one. Here's the, the other lesson in this story. Individual sin always has a community impact. Individual sin always has 
community impact. Israel was defeated by an inferior AI force because of the sin of one person. One. And it, it, it's not like he was the leader of the, of the nation or the chief of a tribe or the head of a clan or the patriarch of a family. He was just a guy. And yet the nation's relationship with God was damaged because of one person's sin. And this is going to rub us the wrong way. This, this, is, this is not who we are. I mean, this is America. This is the land of, of individual rights and individual freedom and individual choice. And I get to do with my life what I want to, and it's none of your business. One of the bedrock convictions in our culture is that I should be able to do whatever I want to do as long as nobody else gets hurt. And you see this show up in all kinds of ways in our culture. For some people, it's my body, my choice. It's all about me and what I think and what I want. And this is going to push back on some of us too. For some of us, it, it is, look, I didn't own slaves, so I, I'm not a part of anything like that. What other people did doesn't have any impact on me, but it does. See, we got to catch up with the Bible on this one. Individual sin has a community impact. The truth is, how you live your life is my business. And how I live mine is yours. Because how I live affects you and how you live affects me. Sin is kind of like secondhand smoke. The smoker takes a direct hit to the lungs, but the scent of burning tar dusts everybody in the room, every hair, every fiber of clothing, invading every pore, compromising not just the smoker's health, but the health of those that he loves. Sin is like an injured part of your body. I, I cut my thumb about two weeks ago. I still have the Band-Aid. I can't tie my shoes. I can't button my shirts. I can't type on my keyboard. I can't turn pages in a book. I can't text on my phone. I, can't, I, I even have to use my teeth to open the bandages I put on my injured thumb because I can't use my injured thumb to open the bandages. Every other part of my body is functioning fine. But a half inch cut on a two inch body part on my non-dominant hand has affected nearly everything I do. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Paul said, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. If one part suffers and to sin is to suffer, every part feels it. Every part is affected. Here's another quote from Ed Stetzer. Private sin can deliver the community of faith into public defeat. And that's because sin is never private. Individual sin always has a community impact. You may still struggle with the idea that one man was executed for such a small crime or that an entire community suffered for the sin of one man. And if that's kind of where you are, you are closer to the heart of God than you imagine. Because one man, Jesus, suffered for the sins of the entire world. And his individual sacrifice continues to have a worldwide impact. The cross of Jesus is the reverse mirror image of Achan. One man's sin affected the whole community. One man's sacrifice made salvation available to all. We're going to do things that we don't always do on Sunday mornings. Lincoln, you guys can come on back up. And if I uh, could get my shepherds and your spouses to find your way around the, the room. We don't all, always offer an invitation or what our Baptist friends call an altar call or whatever you call it in, in uh, whatever church you grew up in. But today it seems appropriate for us to do that. It may be that you really are wrestling mightily with some sin in your life, and you, you're, 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 you're stuck in it. 
I, I understand what that's like. I have been there. I have done that. I have, I have been caught in sin and did not know how to get out. If that's where you are, you're a part of this body and we love you. Let us pray with you. It may be that you're struggling with a health issue right now. It's not, it's, you know, sin is not your problem right now. Your problem is doubt and, and faith. And because of what you're going through physically, it's having a tremendous impact on you spiritually. It's having an impact on your family. You are a part of our body. Let us pray for you. If there's something in your past uh, that has haunted you, that's, you're not there anymore, but the memory of it, the guilt of that still haunts you, you are a part of our body. Let us pray for you. We're going to sing a couple of songs here, an extended invitation time. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand as we sing these songs. And if you need to talk to me or one of our shepherds, please feel free to come to us and we'll pray with you. Let's sing together. Sin and its ways grow. All of my heart is to stone. And I'm left with no strength to arise. You will fall. 
forgive all of my sin if I will confess. Here is my heart, Lord, I lay it open. Search every corner, cleanse every part. Here is my heart, Lord, yielded and broken. Merciful Lord, come and restore. Here is my heart. Savior, gracious Redeemer, slow in your anger, rich in your love, full of compassion, longing to heal and bless. You will forgive all of my sin if I will confess. Here is my heart, Lord, I lay it open, search every corner, cleanse every part. Here is my heart, Lord, yielded and broken, merciful Lord, come and restore. Here is my heart. Well, folks, uh, go pray with people around the room. And if you didn't and you feel like that's something you need to do, let me just urge you, don't live by yourself in that struggle and in that chaos. Call our office. Uh, any of the members of the staff will be glad to talk to you any day. Call one of our shepherds. Call a trusted brother or sister here in Christ. Don't live alone in that. Uh, if you've been thinking about being baptized, let's sit down and talk. See, let's study the scriptures together and see what, see what it says about that, about taking that step if you haven't taken it. If you're struggling with the guilt of a sin, don't live in that. Let us pray with you. Um, we sing about confession, and scripture teaches about confession. And so it's a really powerful, powerful discipline that can be a part of our lives and make a huge difference. I'm just, if you, if you didn't make a move, about a struggle you're having today, don't go too deep into the week without picking up that phone and making a call. God loves you. We love you. We're part of this family. And we'll get through it together. Uh, we're going to have a closing prayer here in just a second. Yeah, come on up. And uh, let me just tell you one quick announcement. Parents of teens, you got a meeting immediately after this service downstairs. Don't forget about that. Glad you were here today. Let's close with a prayer. To God, uh, we just are so thankful for your, for your word, for the stories that uh, are in the Old Testament to teach us. Lord, there's, there's so many times we read the stories about how the idols that the Israelites worshipped, the poles and the fertility gods, but the story that Jody's brought to us today is one that... Uh, really touches us today because it was, it was not worshiping something of wood or, or stone that, that they made that, that we find so silly. This was falling to the temptation of things that we like, of a nice looking garment, of, of riches, of silver. And those are the things that tempt us today. And we thank you for this story for for you showing us just how seriously you take that, deciding that we want something more than something here on the earth, more than we want you. And we thank you for this lesson this morning that, that we can weed out the things in our lives that aren't of you and put you first in our lives and all that we do. So we thank you for for the stories you've written and we thank you for the way that Joey's explained this to us and ask that you would help us as we go through this week to weed out those things that are in our lives that shouldn't be. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen.